All right, now you guys know why I always hound you to exercise, right? Raise your hand if I've, if I've told you to exercise and wouldn't let you late. Thank you. Okay, good. Um, <laughs> Jane's applauding too. Okay, so now we're going to talk about um, the surgical treatment of Parkinson's disease, and that is deep brain stimulation. Uh, in the latter half of my presentation, I'm going to bring up Dr. Paul Waggispak, who is, of course, a neurosurgeon at Neuromedical Center who has been doing DBS with me all along. Um, he's, he was actually involved in the very first DBS case ever done in the state of Louisiana when he was a neurosurgery fellow in uh, New Orleans. So um, he's, been, he's been around it a lot, and he's been a, a great partner to work with, uh, as some of you already know. Um, so today we're going to learn about um, which, which patients are candidates for DBS. We're going to learn uh, how exactly it helps people. We're going to learn how it's done. And we're going to learn, of course, about, about the risks and the benefits. I can't talk about DBS you know, without giving a little bit of um, understanding about what, what the terms I'm going to use mean. So, of, of course, we covered all this in detail last year. We're not going to have a kind of a basic Parkinson's lecture every year, but the basic motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease are tremor, which most people know about, um, the stiffness and the slowness, known as bradykinesia and uh, rigidity. Um, we've got to have fancy terms for everything, right? Uh, and then postural instability, and there's a neat little acronym to help us remember these, uh, TRAP. I should point out postural instability in true Parkinson's disease does usually come a little bit later. Um, so the primary motor manifestations early on are the tremor, rigidity, and bradykinesia. So tremor, stiffness, slowness. Well, when you first develop Parkinson's, the medicines can really control you very well for a number of years. Um, and there's various ways to, to accomplish that with different medications. But as time goes on, after you've had Parkinson's a number of years, you can start to develop what's called motor complications. And there's two kinds of motor complications. There's fluctuations and there's uh, dyskinesias. And I'm going to explain what those are. Motor fluctuations refers to the fact that, um, let's say, most people, you know, eventually have to take levodopa, some form of levodopa, for their Parkinson's disease, so Cinemet or Stilevo or generic levodopa. And at first you can take it two or three times a day and it works fine. You don't really notice that the medicine wears off or anything, but after a number of years, the medicine doesn't last until the next dose and you feel it start to wear off. That is the tremor, the stiffness, the slowness seems to come back before you take your next dose. And so then you might go from three times a day to four times a day to five, five times a day or even more than that sometimes. And so we call that wearing off. So we call off as when, um, when the medicine's not working and you have the motor symptoms. We call that the off state. And when the medicines are working and you're feeling pretty good about the motor symptoms, we call that the on state. So uh, as time goes on, you have more of this wearing off phenomenon. You have to take the medications more frequently, um, very, very much more complicated as time goes on. And then even later on, people can have other kinds of complications called sudden offs where instead of the medicine kind of wearing off slowly, it might suddenly wear off within a few seconds, and that can be a big problem, obviously. And then um, it's also true that as time goes on, that the medicine, you expect it to wear off at a, at a certain time, but sometimes it comes unexpectedly, so we call that an unexpected off. Um, and the longer you have Parkinson's, the higher the chances are that these complications can occur. So we call all of these collectively uh, motor fluctuations. And then there's dyskinesias. Uh, these are the involuntary movements that you might see uh, Michael J. Fox do in an interview. Just can't, looks, looks, looks very fidgety, can't stop moving. And there's a, there's a spectrum, you know, that they can be very subtle, very mild, not bothersome, or they can be very severe, bothersome, even painful, and debilitating. So, 
we, um, we call these dyskinesias. They typically occur when the medication levels are kind of a little bit too high, um, and, but they can also occur as the medicine is sort of kicking in or as it's wearing off. Um, so there's different kinds of dyskinesias you can have, but they're, uh, they can be hard to control. So as, so not everybody gets these, you know, but by the way, not everybody gets dyskinesias. It happens more in younger people with uh, Parkinson's, but most people do get the uh, wearing off uh, if they have Parkinson's long enough. And so what we want to do with the medicines, of course, is to minimize the amount of time that you're in the off state, minimize the amount of time that you have dyskinesias, and therefore that means that you will have more on time, so more good time, where your motor symptoms are very well controlled. So now that brings us to DBS. So what does DBS do exactly? Well, it, it helps us um, reduce these complications, reduce the wear and off time, and reduce the dyskinesias. Uh, it's a surgically implanted device that uh, goes into a deep part of the brain that's involved in the motor control circuits that are involved in Parkinson's disease. And I'll explain how it, how it might work a little bit. The, it's a wire that we implant um, in the brain and it's hooked up under the skin to a wire that goes behind the ear to a pacemaker-like device in the chest wall. Uh, in fact, the same company that makes the pacemakers Medtronics makes the pulse generator in the DBS system and they call it the Activa system. Um, so it's four people who, again, have true Parkinson's disease. They were doing well for a while, but then they start to have so much of these complications that it's hard to control them and regulate them with just manipulation of the medicine and the medication times. So in that individual, they're a good candidate for deep brain stimulation. Um, and so there's specific parts of the brain that we put this wire in. Um, and this DBS system is approved for other diseases too. So people who have a disease called essential tremor, which is actually more common than Parkinson's disease, uh, we put it in the thalamus or the VIM part of the brain. Um, for Parkinson's disease, you can put it in one of two different places. The globus pallidus, which we call GPI, and the subthalamic nucleus, which we call STN. Uh, here, we pretty much always put it in the STN but these two are roughly equivalent. You, you know, some, some places do both, some do one or the other, but they're, they're roughly equivalent. I think more people are doing STN um, nationwide and worldwide. But what we think it does, we're not exactly sure the mechanism of action, but what we think it's doing is by delivering a low voltage, high frequency stimulation to this very specific part of the brain, we think that it's overriding the abnormal firing in the brain that's, that's driving these motor symptoms. So the brain likes to fire in an oscillatory manner in these, in these parts of the brain. And so we, we think that we're overriding that somehow, but that's not known for sure. I mentioned it's, a, it's approved for essential tremor uh, as well as Parkinson's disease. Um, and HDE means um, these two indications, dystonia and OCD, uh, have a special kind of approval from the FDA um, for deep brain stimulation called a humanitarian device exemption, which, which really means these, these are so rare, um, these, these conditions are so rare, it's hard for companies to, to do the same rigorous level of studies that you can do in these diseases, so they give them a special exemption. It's not nearly as commonly used for those conditions as it is for essential tremor and Parkinson's. So how widespread is this technology? Um, it's, it's been used since 1997 or, or, or longer all around the world, really. Um, we have over 80,000 people with DBS all around the world. Um, you know, we've, we've put in over 100 here in Baton Rouge. Uh, I've, I've programmed you know, pr probably a couple of hundred other people who've had it done elsewhere, and, and I just do the programming, plus what Dr. Kader's done. Uh, so there's really a lot of people walking around, even the Baton Rouge area, with this uh, technology. Some, a lot of them in this room, who are doing uh, rather well. Uh, we we have over 2,000 articles on this technology, doing 
research showing, showing how, it, how it's helping people. Um, this is just sort of a diagram that, that shows um, kind of how the wire goes in these, in these deep parts of the brain. Um, this is a picture of the, the pulse generator that goes in the, in the chest wall. We think that in the, in the future um, we're going to have new indications for this, so probably DBS will be used for other things in the future, like uh, maybe control of seizures or obesity or depression or other things that, are, um, that we're still looking at. So we may find different parts of the brain to use that are, that are better. So they're, they're constantly looking at all this. The, the technology's improving and evolving, and, and there's already been a couple of generations of this that um, have come out. Here's here are the dates. So 1997 for essential tremor, so it's nothing new, 16 years, and then was in trials well before that. Um, Parkinson's approval since 2002, although it was used prior to that, um, even without technical FDA approval and then and as I said there's some other new indications lately. The current generation of um, technology in the Activa system, um, here's the three type of batteries that we can implant. We primarily do these two here. These two are non-rechargeable batteries uh, and single cell means somebody that just has one side of the brain stimulator, um, they can have this one. If, you're gonna ha if you have both sides of the brain done, then you're going to need a, a dual channel device um, where both sides can plug in the same pulse generator. Or some people have two different single cells, one on each side. They do make a rechargeable battery, um, but you have to wear like a shoulder harness and you have to recharge it every couple weeks and it's, it's kind of cumbersome. These batteries really last uh, five years, sometimes even longer and it's really pretty easy to change out the battery so we, we, we tend to use these just because it's less of a hassle. Here's the picture of the, the end of the wire that's in the brain has four contacts and so you can see the four contacts here one, two, three, four. There's two different kind of wires we could put in. They're exactly the same except for the spacing is different. Um, this one has a little bit bigger spacing, this one has a little bit smaller spacing and so it you know, this goes through the target part of the brain that I was talking about, and I have some pictures showing that a little better. But we can stimulate one or more of these contacts in a lot of different ways. Um, I, can, I can stimulate just one, or I can do, you know, this one and this one, or I can do this one, this one, this one. And any, any combination is possible, really. So it, it, it allows us to take the shape of the the exact area of the brain that we're stimulating, I can manipulate the size and shape of that area to tailor exactly what you need for your brain. You know, everybody's brain is a little bit different. The, the size of their STN is a little different. It's shaped a little different. We're in different angles through it. So this allows me a lot of leeway in manipulating the field to, to tailor it to your exact needs and to avoid side effects. Um, this is a picture of, um, we, we do a detailed brain MRI prior to surgery, so we plan exactly the trajectory the, that we're going to go into the brain to minimize the risk of complications, and you can kind of see that trajectory here. We, we go right into that part of the brain, which is where the STN is, and this is some different angles, how we get there, and we do all this planning the night before the surgery, uh, and Paul's going to talk a little bit more about that. This is a good picture of what the, where the leads actually are in the brain. So this is an MRI of the brain. This is a MRI of the brain done, uh, or a CAT scan of the brain done, kind of looking at the brain. If you could think about the head being cut this way and looking from the front, you would see this is called a coronal section, and you can see these. This person has bilateral stimulators, and those are the four contacts at the bottom. Now, it's not really that big, okay, but the metal at the bottom of the wire gives an artifact or a false signal that makes it look bigger, okay, so it's not really that big, but it, it does allow you to see exactly where we are in the brain. That's why it's called deep brain stimulation. It really is pretty deep in the brain, and these motor control pathways in the brain are, are, are all, up, all up in here, so this STN um, sends projections to all other parts of the brain down there 
And so it indirectly affects a lot of other parts of the brain by directly affecting that part of the brain. This is a picture of what someone may look like in, in surgery. Um, we use frameless technology here, so there's two ways to do it. You can put a big metal frame, you know, a, kind of a bolted to the skull, and it's, it, it makes it very, it keeps the head still so we can, you know, put it precisely in. But we use a different technology here. It's a little bit more comfortable for people. They don't have to have the metal frame on their head. Instead of that, we, we put these little uh, screws in the scalp under anesthesia, and we use that for our uh, localization and reference points in planning. And so this is what somebody looks like in surgery. And um, after Dr. Wagaspak makes the incision, um, under anesthesia, of course, and reflects the, the scalp back, drills a hole, and then we, we mount this on top of um, the, the, the hole. It looks like a kind of an oil derrick, a little bitty oil derrick, and this is what drives the wire into the brain under precise guidance. And um, uh, patients are awake for this procedure, so that, that makes it kind of interesting. Um, there's a lot going on in the room while this is being done, so there's a lot of equipment that has to be set up. Um, there's a lot of monitoring equipment. Um, we, we bring in an electrophysiologist who's, who's been on you know, thousands of cases. Uh, the Medtronic reps have been on thousands of cases, so there's a lot of experience in the room um, to, to handle all the equipment, to you know, troubleshoot, to, to make sure we're in the right place and not in the wrong place. Um, this is another kind of a color picture that shows what, this is the STN, so that's where we're going. And here's kind of a schematic of where the wire might go through it. Um, and what we're looking at is while the brain, while the wire is being advanced into the brain, we are listening to the brain waves because patients awake. That's why you have to be awake so we can hear the brain waves firing and we can tell by the firing pattern exactly which part of the brain that we're in. And there's a video that's going to show that in a second. But as we go in, we hear different firing patterns for these different parts of the brain. And when we hit the STN, it makes a distinctive sound, and we know we're there. So, then, so we want to make sure that we get a trajectory where we get a, a big, fat piece of the STN in our trajectory. So in other words, if we were to come in an angle here uh, and just hear that distinctive sound for just a small small size, then we know that we're not quite in the right place and we might move it back to get a better trajectory th right through the middle of that structure where we, where we want to be. Um, here's another cartoon that just shows this, this structure. Here's the STN here. Um, so this brain's kind of been cut away at the top, but the deep parts of the brain are still exposed. And um, here's the GPI here, the other place we can put it, but this is where we put it, the, the STN and the Substantia nigra that Dr. Uh, Camella showed in her slides is, is right here under it. Here's another picture of that, a little bit more blown up. Uh, here's the kind of a little animation that shows us um, where, the, where the wire goes in the brain. Let's see if this works. Ooh, not working. Yes, it is. Okay. Um, so it's peeling away, peeling away layers of the brain until we get to this STN and we can see it. Okay. So the other parts of the brain are being peeled away, and now it's just showing us all these deep parts of the brain together. And we're going to introduce the wire. So here's the, the first wire that we put in the brain with the, with the little oil derrick, and it's advancing it slowly. You hear the sound? So we're in the thalamus now. And so we hear a little bit of thalamic firing. Sounds not very loud. Okay, now it's quiet again. So we're getting near where we're outside of this region. It's quiet, quiet. We're about to hit the STN. Should make a noise. Okay, we, we're hearing it. It's not very loud. I apologize for that. But it sounds like a lot of static, basically. It just sounds like static. Um, and so then we're hearing the static. There we go. All through this structure. And then when we get through it, past it, now we're in the nigra, and it makes a different sound. So now we know that in this case, in this theoretical case, 
we had a great path through the structure that we want to be in um, and that's exactly what we want so then we'll take the recording electrode out and then we, we would put in the wire that's going to stay there with the four contacts on the end and you'll see that come in the picture so now we're advancing in this exact same track that we know is the right path go into the subthalamic nucleus and we want to put it so that you know one or two or three of these contacts at the end of that wire are going right through the middle of that structure and that's what we see and the red shows that you know this person is being stimulated we're doing a test stimulation in the operating room to make sure that the person's motor symptoms the stiffness the slowness the tremor are lessened when we turn it on and they're off their medicine since midnight the night before and we also want to make sure that when we turn it on that we're not stimulating one of those other nearby parts of the brain because if it does stimulate the other nearby parts of the brain then we get side effects that we don't want such as tingling uh, that doesn't go away or motor contractions or slurred speech or double vision or any of, of those sorts of things usually not anything painful but things that we don't want you to walk around with all the time obviously so this is just a slide that shows this other part of the brain that we can use the uh, GPI and we can stimulate like I said one or more of these contacts uh, in that in that structure so um, the people that I'm seeing for Parkinson's I can you know I can I can tell when people sort of need it but people that are seeing other doctors you know I, I have no control over that so we like to try to spread the word to make sure that people know and doctors know when is the right time to see a movement disorder specialist to, to maybe see about getting deep brain stimulation um, and then the other problem is some people who really want it you know they're, they're not candidates for one reason or the other and I'll talk about some of the things um, that will make you a candidate some of the things that won't make you a candidate um, so we know there's over a million people with Parkinson's in the United States um, we talked about how the medicine helps people for several years but then they start getting the complications and those are the people that we want to select so um, this is a slide that shows you know kind of the fluctuations that people have um, these are people who start to have the, the, the wearing off and the dyskinesias so this person here let's say that, let's take the yellow line this is somebody uh, I'm sorry the blue line somebody who does not have DBS and they take their medicine here it hasn't kicked in yet so they're, st they're in this off state and the medicine reaches it goes up and reaches crosses this threshold where they start to have more control of their symptoms they're doing well here but then they we overshoot the mark with the medicines and the high level causes dyskinesias and then the the medicines cleared out of our system by the liver and then this pattern repeats itself you know X number of times a day um, some people up to 12 times a day have to do this and this is a two-hour cycle for some people but for most people it's every three four five hours that they're having to deal with this after they've had Parkinson's for a number of years and then you take somebody with DBS and so so how does it change them what well, it smooths out the curve a little bit they still have fluctuations this is not a cure but it treats the symptoms and they have so so as you can see they have less time in the off state less time with dyskinesias and maybe dyskinesias aren't as severe as they were before here okay and the off states are not as deep as they were before so it smooths them out and they have they have better control again still have fluctuations but better control they looked at studies you know evaluating how how much of the off time is decreased uh, well as much as five hours a day so five hours a day is a lot um, you know if you're awake 14 16 hours a day 18 hours a day you know five extra hours of good time is of course really good we looked at um, what's how is this effect sustained so the disease still progresses even though you have this technology and this treatment um, this line here the first line shows we have 60 70 percent something improvement in our uh, motor scores in one year after DBS and if you look at three years and five years for these symptoms the effect is pretty sustained although you know it does go down a little bit because there is progression of disease 
we can turn the stimulation level up a little bit over time, but there is a finite level where you can't turn it up anymore because then it starts to stimulate the other nearby structures. And uh, you know, at a certain point, there's just, there's just no way around that. So it continues to help you, but you know, the, the disease can, can sort of out, outpace the technology. The, the, the advantages of DBS over just the medicines uh, are several. We talked about five hours, more good time. The stimulation is constant, unlike the medicine, which is fluctuating, so it's more predictable. Um, you don't have to worry about, it, about GI absorption because it's just direct stimulation to the brain. In, instead of the pulsatile delivery, it's continuous delivery. That's what we like in our treatment regimens at all times. Before you get the surgery, I like to do a, a test called the on-off test where somebody comes in the clinic off of their medicines since midnight the night before and I do this UPDRS which is the official Parkinson's rating scale. It kind of puts a number to how severe the motor symptoms are. The patients take their medicine in the clinic, we wait for the medicines to kick in and I do some of the test over again and we like to see a 30, if not 50% improvement in the motor scores that establishes that A, you are a responder to the medicine, which is necessary because if you're not a responder to the medicine, then you will not be a responder to deep brain stimulation. So if the Parkinson's medicines don't work for you, then DBS won't work for you either. Um, so who are the people who are not good candidates for DBS? Um, well, as I just mentioned, you have to be a responder to the Parkinson's medicine or this won't help you. Um, so people who don't respond to the medicine, they've got up to an adequate dose and it doesn't help them, then DBS is probably not going to help them either, un unfortunately. Um, special exception, there are some people who, who can't take enough medicine to help them and in those special cases we may still be able to do DBS but we have less certainty that it, that it will help them and they have to accept that, that uh, risk. Uh, people that fall a lot even when the medications are working. So when you're in the on state, medications are working, and you're still having a lot of falls, you may not be a good candidate for DBS because the DBS won't help your balance per se. So if you're having a lot of falls, that really impacts your quality of life to such a degree that helping the motor symptoms may not improve your quality of life at all. If you have significant depression or anxiety, uh, may not be a candidate. And we screen for that with detailed neuropsychological testing and we have three neuropsychologists at the Neuromedical Center who uh, do this for us and help us with this. Of course, if you have other medical problems that preclude you from getting a surgery, severe heart disease or lung disease, etc., then you may not be a candidate. If you have a bleeding disorder, you know, you may not be a candidate. So there, there's some rare things there that can, that can preclude people. Um, not on here really is, is if, somebody's too, um, if somebody's real elderly, uh, say in you know, mid to upper 70s, especially in the 80s, the, the brain starts to shrink as we get older and that causes increased risk of bleeding in the surgery. So we be really careful about that too. Some controversial issues are, um, you know, at what age do we, do we stop doing this for the reason I just mentioned. Um, we test people to make sure they don't have memory loss. If somebody has dementia, that's a contraindication. But, you know, uh, what if they're not quite demented, but almost there. So, you know, where's the cutoff of, of where you let somebody get DBS and where you don't let somebody get it? How much depression or anxiety do you tolerate? Because sometimes DBS can exacerbate those conditions. Um, and then there's the people, like I said, who, who, who maybe can't take the medicine. So how do you know if they respond to it? Um, and then the balance issues I, I talked about too. The main risks during surgery, bleeding. During, during surgery, the main risks are bleeding in the brain and, and seizure. Uh, that's, that's rare. It's less than 10%. But in, in some of those, in a, in a lot of those people that are included in that 10%, the, the bleeding is very mild and really may not even cause a big problem. But of course, it can be big and cause a stroke or even death, theoretically. After surgery, um, the risks are that, that the, the pulse generator can get infected, um, the, the lead can, can get infected, it can, it can move you know, over a little bit and 
but, but these things can be treated with antibiotics. Uh, and in uh, rare cases, we have to take out the battery, let the infection heal, and then sometimes we can, we can put it back in later. The, the, the lead can break or move in the brain. That's pretty rare. Uh, but I have had one patient that um, happened. Um, if, the, if we're not in the right part of the brain or if we didn't put it in the right kind of patient, you know, it may not work. That's, that's always a risk. And then if, we're, if, if I turn it up too high or stimulate the wrong place, that can lead to side effects, but that's reversible. And this slide talks more about these reversible side effects that you can get from stimulating maybe in not quite, not quite the right place or stimulating too much. And these are things that can happen, but of course, patients have a controller. They can actually turn it off anytime they want. If they feel it's, it's doing anything bad, they can just turn it off and, and see if it goes away. So that's nice. Here's the programmer that I, that I have in the clinic that um, I hold, hold it up right up over the battery and I can program it right through the skin with this on-screen little computer here. I just touch the screen and change the settings it transmits the signal through the skin into the battery and I have you know hundred thousand different combinations or more of different settings I can use to to tailor it to exactly your needs this is a video that shows a lady who has had DBS first we're gonna see how she does whoops first we're gonna see how she does she is not on her medicine um, and she, is, she has not had DBS surgery yet. So Parkinson's frequently affects one side more than the other. And this is after her DBS. So you can see it, it, really, it really quiets down the tremor pretty well. Okay. It's not always that dramatic, but that, in that case it is. So now I'd like to bring up Dr. Wagaspak, who is going to uh, talk a little bit about a little bit more about the surgical aspects. Thank you, uh, Dr. Kader, in advance for yielding some time. Um, uh, Dr. Callaghan talked about a lot of the patient selection issues, and uh, truthfully, that's probably the most important aspect of it. Um, I'm fortunate to have uh, two, now three, uh, fellowship trained neurologists, and the patient selection issue, uh, mostly on their behalf, is, is the most important uh, issue. Um, but in general, there are a few cases that someone really shouldn't have surgery from a surgeon's point of view. Um, the main thing is, is dementia or other uh, cognitive uh, issues. Um, the meat of the operation, you have to be awake and you have to participate. Um, there are some centers, I guess you could do it just by imaging, but uh, to get the best clinical results, it's nice to have the patient interactive in the operating room so we can see what kind of effect and what kind of side effects we're going to be able to have. We're also very fortunate that, it, that uh, at our center, uh, the neurologists themselves are in the operating room uh, with us, uh, interacting with the patient, the very one who's going to be programming you in clinic. Uh, so it's really important. And it's not just about being dement demented or not. You have to be able to participate. And you have to be able to handle all the rigmarole of going through uh, the operating room and all that kind of stuff. Um, we consequently try and minimize the time that you're awake um, because that tends to be a limiting factor. And, and currently, uh, we usually get started around 7 and usually by 10 o'clock uh, or even earlier sometimes we're, we're, we're done with needing you to be awake. So um, we, we need you to be able to be awake and participating and, and interactive. Uh, bleeding disorders, if people obviously you're on medications, uh, most of the time can be stopped temporarily. Um, but, um, you know, anytime we do surgery, there's a risk of bleeding. And if you have a bleeding disorder uh, and if you bleed in the brain, uh, it can be absolutely devastating. Um, uh, some medical conditions uh, that can uh, predispose you to bleeding or other things. Um, uh, not very common that we run across something that just cannot be uh, dealt with. Um, and then some structural abnormality in the brain. A lot of times, uh, uh, you know, we don't necessarily know, but we get a preoperative MRI for planning, but it also tells us if there's a tumor or a vascular malformation or something like that that's in the way. We've had two patients that have had some slight brain abnormalities that we've been able to work around and come in through a different angle, uh, and they, they've been able to get uh, uh, stimulation okay. Where do you point? Um, so, 
Most of the preoperative work is done by the neurologist. Uh, some patients come to me because they heard about DBS and, uh, and we'll talk about it obviously, but then uh, before they're a candidate, I, I make sure they see one of our uh, movement guys to make sure that they're the right person in the right uh, you know, setting of their disease. Um, uh, MRI is about the, the main thing that I need uh, to get going before surgery. Uh, there have been a case or two where someone can't get an MRI because they have a pacemaker. We can do it with a CAT scan. Um, we prefer an MRI because uh, it gives us a lot more information, but it can be done with a CAT scan. Um, the MRI has to be done with a certain protocol because we put it on the computer and reconstruct the images so we can uh, uh, plan our targeting. Uh, and then scheduling. It takes some time. Uh, you know, my schedule, his schedule, the OR, all the things he's got to do as far as the uh, the, the testing and whatnot, um, so it takes a little time to do that. It's not something you come see me and then you know three days later we'll be doing surgery, uh, so keep that in mind. Uh, we break it down into three operations basically uh, to try and um, minimize that time when you're awake during the operation, uh, during the main part of the operation. The first, the first stage uh, is usually done a day or two before the operation and th these are the little screws that Dr. Callaghan talked about. Um, so we bring in to the operating room. It's usually the same operating room or, or, or one very similar to where you're actually going to be doing the real operation. So if you get familiar with uh, how that kind of works, uh, some of the people are often the same people on, on all the different days. Um, and we sit you in the operating room table and you're, you're awake at this point and we try and get you as comfortable as possible, try and mimic what's going to happen in a couple of days or so. Uh, sort of a test test run, make sure that your head is in a good position and you know a lot of people have uh, you know aches and comfortable positions and whatnot. Uh, but then we give you sedation and most people are pretty zonked out um, during this point, point and don't really remember any of the, what happens after that. You're not really under general anesthesia, I guess it's like a colonoscopy or something like that in the twilight. Uh, we clip your hair uh, we prep it all out and at, at, at five sites on your head in different areas we make a small incision um, we actually drill a small pilot hole through the outer surface of the bone and then we manually screw this uh, titanium screw into your skull it doesn't go all the way through to the inside uh, but you can see the threaded portion sits there and then it abuts the outer surface of the skull the round portion sticks out of the skin and which is important for localizing um, and uh, we're going to be telling the, the infrared camera where these uh, fiducials are and we can see them on the imaging as well. Once, once we get all of these in we wrap your head up and you go get a CAT scan with the, with the same kind of protocol that the MRI was done. This CAT scan actually has the screws on there and then you go home and it's important that if you're on medications, uh, we want you to stop those Parkinson's medications, not all your medications, just the Parkinson's medications early enough so that tomorrow morning or, or two days later in the morning when we're doing surgery, we'd like you to have as, as, as much of your symptoms as possible. Uh, it's hard to know if we're getting a good tremor effect if your medication is already controlling your tremor. So it's a little inconvenient, but it's uh, helpful to us in the operating room the next day. Uh, while you're at home, we do our planning. We have uh, the CT scan that we just did, the MRI. Uh, there are a variety of uh, standard uh, maps that have been generated over the years, many years ago, uh, that are not based upon your brain, but we use that information, the CAT scan, the MRI. There are standard targets out there. I mean, there, uh, many of these publications have have uh, you know sort of altered or, or averaged you know how many millimeters this way or that way or, or the best uh, spots and so we take all of that information we put it on the computer and we try and uh, plan where it's going to be the best place for you and your brain. Everybody's brain is different so we have to make a little adjustments and it's not always just this big blue uh, circle that you can just aim towards you know uh, always see it just like that. Um, but we do that after clinic when we sit around um, and with our whole team and, uh, and, and we do our planning. Uh, the next morning typically uh, is, is the main operation and this is the part we need you awake and participating for. We bring you in, we usually start around 7 I say, uh, we bring you in, you're awake, we get you comfortable in a kind of a beach chair position in, in, the, uh, um, in the operating room uh, on the table. 
Uh, it takes a little time. Sometimes it can be a little boring and the patient sometimes may you know, drift off to sleep a little bit. Uh, the first part of it, we're really just trying to get everything positioned. Uh, down at the bottom, that's the frame that some centers use. It's perfectly fine. Uh, it gives you very good, accurate localization, but you can't go home with a frame while we plant. So, so you got to put the frame on and then get the CAT scan and or the MRI, then the planning. And so, so that, that kind of starts you off uh, a few hours into a day, uh, and we prefer to do the frameless method. Um, so you can come in basically um, that morning. Uh, anyway, you, you get comfortable, we get you in that position. We, um, we tell the infrared camera where all the screws are. We've already told the computer program the night before where all the screws are on the CAT scan. And we match it all up and then uh, we, we've chosen an entry point based upon your brain anatomy to avoid uh, you know, blood vessels or other things. And, um, and we mark that on your, on your scalp where it's going to be. Um, and then we uh, prep your head and uh, you know, get ready to go. Um, you're awake. You haven't gotten any sedation, any anesthesia. Uh, at this point um, and then what we do is where the incision is it's usually uh, right behind the hairline we try and put all the incisions behind the hair most of us have some hair fortunately uh, to hide it not everybody um, and so you know we can we can try and work with you and be as cosmetic as possible uh, but whatever the incision is it's usually you know, maybe about three inches long or so it can be straight round uh, different options but we inject the scalp with local anesthesia. I don't know if you ever had to go to the emergency room, get something sewn up or had teeth pulled or something like that. It's the same principle. It's not comfortable getting injected, but it's tolerable. And then once it's numb, it's, it's numb. We'll go ahead and make the incision. You are awake. Um, you, most people don't typically feel the incision. Uh, sometimes we have to give a little bit more medication. Um, and then um, Pretty much, once you're through the skin, you're on the bone, and, and then most people don't feel anything after that as far as pain. There's not really pain sensors in the bone. We'll drill a hole in the bone. It's uh, typically described as very loud, like you're standing next to a train. Um, typically doesn't hurt, uh, and uh, it lasts maybe 30 seconds, 40 seconds uh, on average. And then, um, then there's a couple of membranes underneath there we open up. Usually they're not painful either. We can anesthetize them if we need to. Uh, and then there's a little fidgeting around where we build that tower, that oil derrick that you, you saw. Um, sometimes the patients get a little uh, tired and, and just drift off. That's okay. Um, and usually by about 8 o'clock, uh, we're, we're about ready to go. Um, so the, your neurologist will walk in the room and we'll start the microelectrode recording. Um, the, uh, this is when we need you awake. They'll, they'll start playing with your arms and seeing what kind of symptoms you have. We'll listen to the, uh, the recordings that you've heard some of before. Uh, and we'll do this. And uh, sometimes we make a second pass, a couple of millimeters one way or the other, based upon uh, all the different things that uh, we've looked at before in your particular brain and what we're finding in the operating room. And once we uh, find something that seems reasonable, we'll actually turn it on. Um, We'll trial it. We'll give a little current and we'll uh, watch and see what kind of tremor control you have or how relaxed your arm or, or, or leg may get and whether you're having any side effects. Um, and once it seems that we've uh, you know, got a good location, we'll uh, put the final electrode in that, uh, that you saw a picture of as well. We'll do a little bit more testing to make sure that we're getting uh, what we want to get and, uh, and, and that the side effects are, are not something that's going to impede us. Uh, impede you from being able to use the device. Um, and then that's about it. Once, once we don't require you to be awake and participating anymore, we'll give you some medication and zonk you out. Uh, typically that whole part of it, like I said, may last two to three hours, typically at the most. Uh, every now and then um, patient selection is important. If you're older uh, and you're not as tolerant, you, you get more tired easily, you get a little fidgety, you're uncomfortable, you got to pee, or this is sore, and that's, uh, it takes a little longer to make all these adjustments along the way. So we try and just, you know, get to it right away. Um, once, uh, once you're sedated, we'll go ahead and remove the oil derrick and take all the screws out and we'll uh, bury the wire r right behind the ear here and, and sew you up. And, uh, then you'll stay overnight in the ICU just to watch in case there's any problems. Um, usually there's not problems. Uh, one of the major complications that can happen is very, very unusual, but can happen is, is bleeding. Um, and if there's bleeding in the brain, obviously the, the first way to, 
detect it would be some neurologic change and so the ICU observation is very important. We'll get a CAT scan either later that evening or in the morning to make sure that everything looks good. The other complication we see from time to time is some people are very uh, brittle on their medication and when they've been off for a few hours and they've been giving a, given some new medications from anesthesia or, or maybe an anti-seizure medication and some other things, they, they tend to get off a little bit um, and, and their mental status may change a little bit. Um, and, and in the end, that usually passes, but uh, sometimes it's, it's unexpected and, and a little bit more uh, severe than we were anticipating. But almost everybody goes home the next day, uh, usually feeling back to pretty much normal. Uh, the only other thing to keep in mind is that uh, just the act of putting the electrode in there causes a little bit of swelling in that area, and you get a benefit from that. Uh, the electrode's not on, the battery's not even in, uh, but you'll get some benefit in your symptoms. And uh, b b be aware, it's going to go away in a couple of days, and you'll be back to, to your normal self. Um, then the third part of the operation is, is done fairly electively. It takes about a half hour to do the operation to an hour to do the operation, and it can be scheduled uh, pretty easily almost any time. Within a week or two after surgery, uh, you come in as an outpatient, and this is typically done a, a, under general anesthesia. It has been done under sedation and local anesthesia, but we usually try and, and do it under general. It usually goes a little bit easier that way. Most people can, can tolerate with medical clearance, you know, 30, 40, 50 minutes of general anesthesia. Uh, and all this is is just making a small incision here, making an incision here, making a little pocket, just like the pacemaker, uh, like the guy here, he's got one on each side. And we actually tunnel the wire under the skin between the two incisions. We don't make a big, long incision. You're, you're asleep when all this has happened. Um, and, uh, and then we just connect it all up. Uh, there's a little lump that's here where the very thin electrode is connected to a little bit thicker electrode as it, you know, this one's got to cross the neck and it's got to be a little bit more tolerant. And so sometimes you can actually see the wire under the skin right here, especially if you're older and your uh, skin is fairly thin. But that's okay. Usually the therapy is very, very much worth it. Uh, the, we've had a couple of hunters uh, who, who don't like it up here, so we can put it in the abdomen. We had some, uh, some ladies who, who want it in the abdomen as well, so it's not up there. Some people have a pacemaker. We have to put it on the other side. It can really pretty much go almost anywhere if you, if you plan it appropriately. And, uh, you know, it's done in the morning typically, and people go home same morning. Um, and then it's just up to the neurologist when they uh, see you in clinic and get it scheduled. The risks, uh, he talked about some of them. This is an example of a brain hemorrhage. This is not actually from, uh, from a deep brain stimulator, but that's what it might look like. It could be tiny. It could be larger than that. Um, but, you know, it doesn't really happen very often at all. Probably, I think, uh, nationwide about a half percent or less. Um, and the devastating large ones are, are, are not as common. Uh, but it can happen. And if it can happen, you, you can die from it. So it's, uh, it's, not, it's not to be taken too lightly. Uh, most people recognize that they're at a point in their disease where uh, they're, they're not happy enough anyway. And, and, and the vast majority of people get a good benefit. Infection or malfunction. Infection is a risk with any operation. Not too common either. We've been fortunate. Uh, but uh, most of the time it's not an infection from the surgery itself. It's, uh, we had one guy had a, a big pimple in the area where this was and I think it got infected that way uh, some months later or a year or so later. Uh, but it can happen. And the unfortunate with infection is you usually can't just take antibiotics. If you catch it early enough, you can. But if it gets the device itself infected, a lot of times you, you can't ever eradicate the infection until you take the device out. Once you're healed, you can put it back in, but you've got to go through all that again. Um, and malfunction, also not very typical, but every now and then the, the wires can break. Uh, they're just devices. They can break or a, a little screw can come unloose or fluid can get in or something can happen. And, uh, is, as long as it's not the one that goes into the brain, it can all be repaired or replaced uh, and, and you can still use the same electrode. Obviously the one that goes into the brain can be repaired and replaced, but we've got to go through a lot of that again. Okay, thank you very much.